So today, uh, we are in the third series, uh, third week of a series that we're doing called How To, series where we're talking about how to do some things that are important for Christians to know how to do and hopefully do pretty well. Uh, so far, we've uh, discovered, uh, discussed how to share your faith. That was the first week. Last week, we talked about how to stay married. I hope some of y'all are still married after that last week. <clears throat> uh, now today, we're going to be talking a little bit about how to hear God's voice. So on December the 1st, 1955, uh, Rosa Parks sat down on bus number 2857 in Montgomery, Alabama. When a number of white passengers then boarded, she was, of course, asked to give up her seat, as was custom at the time, and she refused. She stayed seated. And, of course, her refusal was one of the defining moments of the civil rights movement. Um, When asked later why she stayed seated that day, uh, Rosa Parks gave a number of different answers over the years. You ought to read her autobiography. It's it's really interesting. Um, But for anybody who's familiar with Parks' overall life, it's really clear that she stayed seated that day on bus number 2857, December 1st, 1955, in Montgomery, Alabama, because she believed that she had heard God's voice telling her to stay seated. She believed she had heard God's voice telling her that enough was enough, and today was the day to not get up again. And all these years later, right here we are, black and white and brown people all all sitting together. At least in part because Rosa Parks was somebody who knew how to hear God's voice. Now about eight years later, 90 miles up the road in Birmingham, four men who also thought they had heard God's voice went to church, to 16th Street Baptist Church with 15 sticks of dynamite early on a Sunday morning. They placed it under the church steps where it later blew up, killing four young girls who were changing into their choir robes before church that morning. Now, these four men were under the spell of that um, delusional but sadly persistent form of faith that believes itself compatible with hatred. Sadly, you know the kind. And they thought <clears throat> that they had heard God telling them to put a stop you know, to racial integration. Four little girls were killed because four men, four grown men, did not know how to hear God's voice. It's not always that dramatic, but um, learning how to hear God's voice well, it is always consequential, isn't it? Because God's voice is always catalytic. One way or the other, it is catalytic, you know? Uh, It sets things in motion. It puts things to a stop. Lives and relationships and civilizations, they rise and fall. They flourish and wither based upon their ability or inability to hear this voice that is the beginning and end of all things. Um, For a quick disclaimer, given the the scope of the topic at hand, how to hear God's voice, uh, there's no way that I could possibly say all the things that could be said about how to hear God's voice. But what I hope is that I can say some things that will help you better hear some of the things that God might be saying to you. So if you've got your Bibles, grab them. We will be in Acts 10. I'm going to read an important story from early church history there. Verses 1 through 22. It will be on the screen for you as well if you would like to read along. Excuse me. Now, there was a man at Caesarea named Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian cohort, a devout man and one who feared God with all of his household and gave many alms to the Jewish people. And he prayed to God continually. Now, about the ninth hour of the day, he clearly saw in a vision the angel of God who had just come in and said to him, Cornelius. And fixing his gaze on him and being much alarmed, understandably, he said, what is it, Lord? And he said to him, your prayers and alms have ascended as a memorial before God. Now dispatch some men to Joppa and send for a man named Simon, who's also called Peter. He is staying with a tanner named Simon, kind of confusing, whose house is by the sea. Now when the angel who was speaking to him had left, he summoned two of his servants and a devout soldier, <clears throat> those who were his personal attendants, and after he explained everything to them, he sent them to Joppa. On the next day, as they were on their way and approaching the city, Peter went up on the housetop about the sixth hour to pray. But he became hungry, and he was desiring to eat. It's a life verse of mine. Uh, But while they were making preparations, he fell into a trance, and he saw the sky opened up, and an object like a great sheet coming down, lowered by four corners to the ground. And there were in it all kinds of four-footed animals and crawling creatures of the earth and birds of the air. And a voice said to him, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Well, by no means, Lord, for I've never eaten anything unholy and unclean. Again, a voice came to him a second time. Well, God is cleansed, no longer consider unholy. This happened three times, and immediately the object was taken up into the sky. Now, while Peter was greatly perplexed in mind as to what the vision which he had seen might be, behold, the men who had been sent by Cornelius, 
having asked directions for Simon's house, appeared at the gate. And calling out, they were asking whether Simon, who was also called Peter, was staying there. Now, while Peter was reflecting on the vision, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are looking for you. But get up, go downstairs, and accompany them without misgiving, for I have sent them myself. Peter went down to the men and said, Behold, I'm the one who you're looking for. For what is the reason that you have come? And they said, Cornelius, a centurion, a righteous and God-fearing man, well spoken of by the entire nation of the Jews, <clears throat> was divinely directed by a holy angel to come for you to his house and to hear a message from you. Right. Acts 10, verses 1 through 22. So uh, this guy named F.B. Meyer has this really great quote on how to hear God's voice. We're going to read it real quick, then get back to our text. He said, God's impressions within and his word without are always corroborated by his providence around. And we should wait quietly until these three focus into one point. Now, if you don't know what you ought to do, stand still until you do. And when the time comes for action, circumstances like glowworms will sparkle along your path. And you will become so sure that you are right when God's three witnesses occur that you could not be sure though an angel beckons you on. Now, I love the simplicity of this quote and this general idea that when we're trying to hear God's voice, we should realize that God speaks to us from within, from without, and from around. Now, the quote's not perfect. It promises a little bit too much. I mean, I don't know about you, but uh, the glow worms don't always come for me, right? But it, it's a good general premise. And so what we're going to do is we're going to use this framework, and then we're going to expand on it a little bit as we explore our text, okay? So back to our text with that framework in mind. We've got two men and two visions. Okay, Cornelius, he's a God-fearer, which means he worships Yahweh, but he's not fully Jewish, if you know what I mean. And at this point in the early church story, all the earliest Christians, again, who were all Jewish, they are under the impression that Gentiles are unclean and thus probably not candidates for inclusion in Jesus' new family because, not because they were bigoted, it's because that's what their Bible seemed to say to them. But Cornelius the Gentile has this vision where an angel tells him <clears throat> to send people to go find, <clears throat> excuse me, a fellow named Peter, the apostle Peter as we know him. Now the next day, Peter's on the rooftop and he's trying to pray, but he's having a hard time. Why is he having a hard time? Did you pick it up in the text? Well, it's not a trick, it's because he's hungry. And I, for one, really love this detail because it just makes me happy to know that even a Christian as great as the apostle Peter found it difficult to be spiritual on an empty stomach. You know what I mean? Does anyone feel very seen right now when you read this verse? Oh, there are times I'm trying to pray, you know, I'm trying to be so pious, I'm trying to be so spiritual. I'm like, dear God, almighty and most merciful Father, God of our fathers, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, infinite creator God, who's Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Hold up, is that queso I smell? Right, like, hey, Lord, I need to get to the bottom of this queso central that I'm on. Right, so he's the apostle Peter, big deal, but he's also, he's just a dude who needs a snack. We've all been there. And God uses this moment of hunger to hit him with a culinary vision. The sheet falls down from the heavens. You know, dinner table sheet is the idea you get. It's filled with all these different kinds of animals, many of which have been declared unclean by texts like Leviticus 11. And yet this voice comes to Peter and says, hey, I want you to kill and eat. And Peter's really confused. And you can understand why, right? Because it seems like God is telling him to do something that God has also told him not to do in the Bible. You see how that would be confusing? This happens three times, and the sheets pull back up into the heavens, and Peter snaps out of his vision. And so Peter's on the roof. He's trying to sort this vision out, and Cornelius' his men arrive at the house, at which point the Spirit says to Peter, that's what verse 19 says. This is one of those instances where it would be great if we could get a little more color commentary. You know, like, okay, what was that? What did it look like? But we don't really get anything. We just get the Spirit says to Peter that the, these three men are coming from Cornelius, and he should join them, share the gospel with them, because God was up to something radical in their midst. And so what can we learn here from the story about how to hear God's voice? Well, I think the first thing that we have to understand if we want to better hear God's voice is this. Um, let's start with this. Peter, he was not actively trying to hear God's voice on the rooftop that day because he needed God's specific answer to some specific question. But rather, Peter was up on the rooftop praying that day because Peter loved God. And this is really important to understand. In other words, Peter, uh, his only agenda as he was up there on the rooftop in prayer that day, his agenda was just being with God. It was not getting something from God. And, and this is the first thing that you have to understand if you want to hear God's voice well. Namely, if you want to only hear from God when you need God to tell you what to do, then what you really want is to use God. 
The only time you want to hear from God is when you need God to tell you what to do, give you the right decision for something that you got going on, that what you really want is to use God. And look, I, I get it, man. Life is hard. And we need help and guidance. And, and God is so glad to give us help and guidance. But if all you are in it for is help and guidance, then man, <clears throat> you have cultivated a very cold and calculated relationship with your creator. I think about treating another person like that. And again, I, I get it. And so much of the time, I'm as guilty as anyone. So much of the time, most of the time, when I come to God, like in prayer, I've, I've got an agenda in hand. Do any of you ever do the agenda in hand thing where I, I show up and I'm like, God, infinite creator of the universe. I have five minutes, and so we're gonna need to make it quick. <laughs> Here's the agenda, Lord. Um, I need you to help me and tell me what to do now. And God's like, Austin, my man, it's been so long since we talked. What's going on with you? And I'm like, oh, it's not on the agenda, Lord. If you see this, the agenda is real simple. It's one bullet point. It's you tell me what to do so I can get back to things. Snap, snap, dance clown. And God's like, ah, nah, man, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. But, I mean, we could talk a bit. You could tell me what's going on with you. I could tell you what's going on with me. I got this thing going on in another galaxy. It's going to blow your mind. I'm about to introduce the aliens. It's going to be unbelievable. All right, whatever. We could talk about it a little bit. What do you think? At which point I've what? I've, I've already checked out and I am on Christian TikTok searching how to hear God's voice, right? I'll just go around you then, big guy. I don't have time for this. I'm very important. Dallas Willard puts this really well in the introduction to a book he wrote called Hearing God. He says, it's very important to remember and to always keep before your mind this fact. You are an unceasing spiritual being created for an intimate and transforming friendship with the creative community that is the Trinity. That's what you are. Learning to hear God is much more about becoming comfortable in a continuing conversation and learning to consistently lean on the goodness and love of God than it is about turning God into an ATM for advice or treating the Bible like a crystal ball. There's a lot more that we could say here. We could spend a whole sermon on it, but I'll leave you to follow the breadcrumb trails uh, on your own a bit because I want to move on now to this more pragmatic issue of how we go about hearing God's voice. And so let's start with from within. And when we talk about hearing God's voice from within, we are talking about um, you know, the, the, the somewhat distinct but inescapably overlapping constellation of rich psychological phenomena that constitute our inner experience of life. All right, so in other words, when we hear God's voice speaking to us from within, what do we mean? We mean through like our conscience, our desires, our rationality, our intuitions. There's more stuff we could say there, but you get the general idea. Um, we see this here in Acts 10. Right? Peter has what first? Well, he has a vision in his brain. He has a vision. And then we're also told, of course, in verse 19, that the Spirit told him to go to Cornelius. We're not given any particular details as to what it was like when the Spirit told him, but we're left to surmise that it was some sort of inner voice that Peter heard. And I, I know that many of us have had experiences like this, and probably all of us have heard somebody else describe an experience like this. Right, this experience where through this rich constellation of conscience, desire, reason, intuition, whatever, we just feel God like speaking to us from within, nudging us in certain directions. Have you ever felt that? Right, and sometimes it's a nudge towards something big. You know, it's like a sudden nudge. You're like, oh my gosh, okay, I guess we're, we're doing that. I'm gonna do this. Sometimes the nudge is slow. You find yourself like barely pushed along centimeter by centimeter over the years. You look back and it's, oh, Oh, that, oh, yeah, that was, it was God the whole time nudging me towards this, of course. How did I not see it? Sometimes it's a nudge towards something big, like a career transition. Sometimes it's a nudge towards something really small, like an encouraging or repentant text message that when you don't want to sin, but you know you should sin, God keeps poking on you about it. Again, there's a lot more that we could say, but it's safe and sound to say that God's voice does often come to us from within. And that brings us to God speaking to us from without. When we talk about God speaking to us from without, what we primarily mean is through Scripture and tradition. Now, Scripture, the Bible, you know, Scripture in the Bible. Tradition, you might be uh, a little less familiar with. Tradition, capital T, meaning something like the historic experience of the church's life with God, the people of God's life with God. You might have noticed that uh, Scripture and tradition are very closely linked, that there's a sense in which Scripture is a part of tradition. Because think about it. Who wrote the Bible? Well, God. How did God write the Bible? Well, God wrote the Bible through people who lived with God. That's how the Bible was written. And then who decided which books of the Bible would be in and which books would be out? Well, uh, God through people who were living with God. And so you get the idea. Scripture and tradition, they are in a sense distinct, but they are also inseparable. Now, 
If you're here today, then chances are that you believe, or at least you know that you're supposed to believe, that God speaks to us through the Bible. Right? You know that. And for some of us, this is very, very simple, right? God wrote the Bible, and so when we read it, we are hearing God's voice. One plus one equals two. Like, it's just that simple. But then for some of us, it's, it's a little more complicated, you know, because you get in your heads. You're those contrarian people. You know, you get the feels. You get the voices in your head. You're like, whoa, well, okay. Yes, it is true that God, in some sense, wrote the Bible, but God wrote it through these imperfect and flawed people. And so then when we read these words that God wrote through these imperfect and flawed people, we can't help but interpret them as interpret, uh, imperfect and flawed people because there's no such thing as not interpreting the Bible, right? right? You look down and you read those words. How do you know what those words mean? Well, you interpret them in your brain, your imperfect brain. I hope you know your brain is imperfect. And so you, you know, we try to read the Bible. We just get all confused and doubtful with all these other voices in our head just asking about the mechanics of how does it work and how does it work and we're going to talk a little bit uh, in a couple of weeks about how to deal with doubt, how to doubt and still believe. You'll see there's on the agenda in a couple of weeks. But for our purposes this morning, I just want to share two really simple foundational principles on how to read the Bible in such a way that you can be confident that it's God's voice that you're actually hearing when you read it. Okay, principle number one. The Bible was written for you, but it was not written to you. So if you want to know what God is saying to you, then you first need to know what God said to them. Follow. The Bible was absolutely written for you. It was not written to you. It was not written to Austin Fisher, right? It was written to, what are first century Jews, uh, fourth century Jews in exile, whatever the case may be. Slightly more academically, we could put it this way. If you want to know what something in the Bible might mean for you, then you first need to understand what it meant in its original context. Because what it means for you needs to be anchored in what it meant for them. Otherwise, you're just making it up. So for example, take a famous verse, a great verse like Jeremiah 29, 11. Y'all know this verse? It's a wonderful verse. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare, not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. It's a great verse. But if you're in one of those places where you just need a verse for something, you know what I'm talking about? Sometimes you just need a verse. Oh. And you go to Jeremiah 29, and you sass that thing out, and you say, well, what this verse means to me, you know things are about to get kooky when somebody starts with that. What this verse means to me is that God is promising to bless this new meth lab that I'm going to build. It's going to be called Meth Lab 2911. We're going to write Jeremiah 2911 on all the baggies. The Lord has promised to bless it. My Bible tells me so. You laugh. I've, I've seen stranger. Um, if you read the Bible that way, then, you know, man, it's, it's not the Lord's voice you're hearing. Walter White's voice, perhaps, but it's not the Lord's voice that you're hearing if you read the Bible that way. So hearing God's voice in the Bible, look, it's not an interpretive free for I don't care what it, you think it means for you if you've not first done the discipline work of understanding what the text originally meant and then stepping forward and what it might mean for you. You gotta go back before you can come forth. This brings us to the second principle, which is that only the Bible as a whole can be treated as the word of God. Okay? Only the Bible as a whole, this is from Dallas Willard too, can be treated as the word of God. Uh, this is important. Because as you have perhaps noticed, if you have read the Bible and paid like any kind of attention, the Bible says a lot of different stuff about a lot of different stuff. Have you noticed this? Sometimes people will come up to me like, Austin, what does the Bible say about blank? I'm like, well, buddy, how long do you have? <laughs> you know, like, it says a lot of different stuff about that, right? And um, this is important because God does not speak with a single, simple voice in Scripture. Have you ever thought about that? God could have just chosen one person to write the Bible. Moses was pretty good. David, Paul, John the Revelator. God could have chosen anything, but God, intent, the sovereign God of the universe, chose not to use one person to write the Bible. Isn't that interesting? Rather, God chooses all these different people with all these different voices, men and women, young and old, Jews and Gentiles, blue collar, white collar, poets and prophets, mystics and rationalists, conservatives and progressives, coastal elites and hillbillies, those who prefer Merlot and those who prefer Miller Lite and those who prefer Margaritas, right? They all get a voice in scripture or by way of a musical analogy, right? I am on a stage here with instruments. Hearing God's voice in scripture, it's, uh, it's, it's less about hearing like one single instrument. I can just hear the acoustic, I can hear the drums, I can hear the bass, that's God's voice. No, it's about learning how to hear like the band. It's about learning how to hear the music of what God is saying through scripture, not just having ears for one single instrument that you happen to like. And we'll come back to this analogy at the end, but now let's move forward <clears throat> to this idea of God speaking to us from around. 
And the basic idea in God speaking to us from around is that God speaks to us through our circumstances. It's closely related to this idea of providence, uh, which is that God is involved in the daily circumstances of our lives, gently nudging us, pulling us, prodding us, moving us in certain directions. The Quakers have a wonderful little phrase, as they often do, to describe this, and it's the phrase, way will open. Way will open. You know it's a good phrase because you already kind of know what it means, right? And way will open means that when we're pursuing faithfulness, not when you're living perfectly, nobody lives perfectly, when we are pursuing faithfulness, the way that we should go gradually opens up in front of us. The way opens. But of course, sometimes providence kind of works the opposite way. Parker Palmer wrote a great book about this. The book's called Let Your Life Speak. It's a short little book, one of the best books on guidance I've ever come across. And he's talking about this uh, experience in his life where he really needed God to tell him what to do. One of those fork in the road moments, and he's waiting for way to open, but way was just not opening. God was not telling him what to do. And so finally he goes and he speaks with this wise Quaker woman named Ruth, who had a reputation for being discerning. And so he explains the situation, how he's begging God to tell him what to do, but the way just won't open. God will not tell him what to do. And so finally, after like 30 minutes, Ruth finally speaks up. And she says, in 60 plus years of living, the way has never opened for me. Which is very depressing to hear when you've gone to someone for some advice on discernment. So he was very depressed at this news. But then the smile kind of flashed across her face and she says, but... A lot of way has closed behind me and has had the same guiding effect. From which Palmer drew the lesson, there is as much guidance in what does not and cannot happen in my life as there is in what can and does, maybe more. Sometimes way opens, sometimes way closes, but at the end of the day, it all gets us in the same place. When I was um, in grad school, I tutored Baylor athletes as a side hustle. I was raised a Longhorn fan, so I just torpedoed their grades. It was fancy. No, I <laughs> did my best. And uh, I remember this one particular guy I, I tutored. He was a basketball player. And he, he was, you know, he's a, he's a good basketball player. He's a D1 basketball player at Baylor. They got a great program, so, you know, I, I probably could have taken him. But, I mean, he was a good basketball player. And um, he wasn't a stud, though, right? He was, like, good, but not a stud. You would know his name if I told you, but I can't tell you. He's, he's. So... We're in a session, and he was really struggling in this class, and I was really getting on him, because I was like, dude, you're gonna flunk. Like, you're gonna fail this class if you don't start taking tutoring more seriously and do your homework like one out of four times or like something. Athletes get a little bit of a, you know, love curve there. Uh, But you gotta do something, man. You gotta give your teacher something to work with. And finally, he got really frustrated at me, and he just says, Austin, this class doesn't matter, man. It doesn't matter if I fail this class, because I'm gonna be playing in the NBA soon anyways, because God has told me I'm gonna be playing in the NBA. And I did not say this out loud because he was a very big man, (laughs) very big man. But I did think to myself in that moment, my man, my man, if God wanted you to play in the NBA, he would have given you a better jump shot because that thing is broken, bro. You think the NBA just clamoring for six foot one shooting guards to shoot 13% from three? (laughs) Like, come on, man. You want to get on that court? You better become a physical therapist or something because you're not, mm -mm, mm-mm, mm-mm. The way closed, you're just not seeing it. You're going to need that degree. And so um, now let's go back to our story and try to put all this together here. Because the last and most important thing that we need to understand about hearing God's voice is that we hear it most fully when we hear it converging from within, from without, and from around. And not just when we think we hear it coming from one single direction. Make sense? Let's flesh it out a little So in Acts 10, we see that Peter is someone who listens to God's voice coming from without, from scripture, from tradition, right? Peter knew his Bible really well. He probably had most of it memorized completely. And so when this vision comes to him, he knows that he has to reconcile this vision. As profound as this vision is, he still struggles with it, doesn't he? He doesn't just immediately like run to Cornelius' house. Why? Because he knows he has to reconcile his vision with his Bible. And so much of the New Testament is just this. It's people like Peter humbly working to reconcile what God had said in Scripture with what God seemed to be saying through this miraculous work of the Holy Spirit among the Gentiles, right? And then as we've already noted, we see God's voice come to Peter from within. The dude has a vision, right? The Spirit says to him this inner voice from this rich constellation of psychological phenomena that constitute all of our inner lives. And then God's voice also comes to Peter from within. 
around, right? From these three men who show up knocking on his door with a wild invitation. And it's only in the convergence of these three things that Peter understands that it is indeed God's voice that he's heard. This is a really helpful little graphic. You wanna look for the convergence of within, without, and around. And when you hear convergence, you can be confident that it is indeed God who you've heard speaking. This concept of convergence is very, very important. Because some of us, I won't name any names, but some of us are maybe just like a little too prone to be a little too confident in our ability to discern God's voice speaking to us from within. You know what I'm talking about? Yes, I'm talking about you, you pietists and dreamers, you unaccredited spiritual psychology soothsayers, right? Because look, we love you. We love your piety. It is a gift to the body of Christ. We love your piety. We love all these things that God speaks to you from within. But here's the deal. Sometimes, y'all, sometimes we just need some receipts for all these things that God's allegedly whispering into your heart. We need some checks and balances, man. We can't just take your word for it. What if it was the queso talking, right? How, how do I know? How do I know? We need some checks and balances. Some of us are way too prone to trust the inner voice. And then some of us on the opposite end of the spectrum, man, we are way too prone to be so cold and like nasty rationalistic and calculated in our spirituality. We're the people who like, we think God has said everything that God is or isn't gonna say in the Bible. That's all there is. And all this God speaking to us from within, that's a bunch of sentimentalistic, therapeutic nonsense, speaking from around, no, that's just you seeing what you wanna see. I don't believe in any of that. And so rather than being people who only have ears for like one instrument. Somebody who can only hear drums, somebody who can only hear bass, somebody who can only hear cowbell, all right? Hearing God's voice well is about learning how to hear the band. It's about learning how to hear the music that is God's voice, amen? Amen. Let's pray. Gracious God, thank you for the gift of today. We are here because and only because a good and gracious God has decided to host us once again. We come before you, God, and we confess that your voice is the voice that set everything in motion. It sustains all things right now, and it will carry us into the future. And so we humbly ask that you would help us to hear it and to hear it better, to listen for that convergence in our lives. God, I know uh, that so many of us, we need guidance. We need help. There are people with huge decisions in the room today that have been lingering. I pray that you would indeed speak to those who need guidance because you want to give guidance. You tell us to ask. But then most of all, God, of course, we pray that you would help us to become people who enjoy communing with our maker. That we would be people who understand that we are creatures who are created for an intimate relationship with the creative community that is the Trinity. That's why we're here so I will always be here. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.